Okay. Let us begin. I was showing you how loads dropped out <clears throat> in sets of bolts. Here's some tests they did. P on the middle plate, P over 2 on the outside plate. This obviously depends a lot on how stiff the two plates are and uh, material out of which they're made, but basically you can cover any of that uh, variation. Here's what they found. Here's the middle plate pulling. You'll notice that the hole in which it was put, you know, is really shows up big here. This bolt is really taking out load and dumping it into the next plate. Uh, here the next one's not bent as much. This one's not bent as much. This looks like it has still to go. And by the time this one gets really deformed, this one will be even more deformed, but it'll still be holding its load. It'll just be severely deformed. We discussed block shear. We mentioned that we don't even have a symbol for F sub U for shear. Since it's six tenths of F sub U ultimate intention, we just use, we don't even have that symbol, you know, just to make sure you know what I'm talking about. It's F sub U in the book, six tenths of F sub U. If you ever have something in shear, a surface in shear, then it will be six tenths of the tensile strength. Now, if the bolt people use that or not, that's the bolt people's problem. And uh, if we use their specifications in our specs, <clears throat> then, uh, you know, we'll do whatever they do. But for the types of steel we use, structural steel, uh, A36, all that kind of stuff, we're going to be using six tenths of the ultimate for the ultimate in shear, and the yield in shear will be six tenths of the yield in tension. We mentioned that. As the steels got stronger, we started having problems with the little corners breaking off. When we would pull these little corners out, we would notice that some of it got sheared, and therefore you really ought to be applying a F sub ultimate in shear, which would be six tenths of F sub ultimate in tension, which would be six tenths of F sub Y on the sides that are sheared, wiped across, and the little end here that's actually is placed in tension, you ought to be using F sub U, T, or just F sub U on that area to determine how much load it took to pull this corner off. That's called block shear. Uh, here's a typical channel or a wide flange where someone's bolted something in the middle. I can't tell if it's a channel or a wide flange. And it tore this little block out of the middle. And that little piece of steel that used to be called the web of the channel is now part of the plate. On the other hand, it could be that the channel is stronger or thicker than the gusset plate, in which case the little plug will come out of the gusset plate. If they're both made out of the same steel and the channel is thicker than the gusset plate, then I know immediately to go check on the gusset plate because the pattern of failure is the same and uh, I would use the thinner of the two materials. If this is made out of a high strength material and that's a low strength material and one's thicker and one's thinner, I wouldn't have any, any idea. I'd just have to check them both. Here are the parameters that you will be using. This happens to be a channel, flange, web, flange. Happens to be a 6 by 13. It's about 6 inches deep. It's, about, it's not about. It's 13 pounds a foot, pretty much right on the button. They have 7 8 inch bolts in the connection, which means these are, as far as you're concerned, 1 inch holes. The pattern, that's the spacing, spacing, spacing. That's the gauge. Well, there aren't any slanted lines there, so it really won't matter whether or not you know what the gauge or the spacing 
is because it won't show up in the equation and the thickness of that web. Check it out in the book, 0.437 inches. This little block will pull out and the first thing you'll have to do is calculate the gross areas. So on the end, I would tell you that the gross area in tension is the thickness of the channel times the five inch dimension across the bolt holes. And in shear, there are two shearing surfaces, one on the top, one on the bottom. That's area gross tension. Here's area gross shear over two. The dimension between the last hole and the entire block being pulled out was eight inches. So that surface area is eight by 0.437. And there are two sides. So in the calculations they ask you to perform for strength, you will find you need area gross tension and area gross shear. There's your numbers. <clears throat> Since there are holes, <clears throat> holes in here, you'll have to take the effect of these holes out of the gross area to get the net area. To get the net area, you would take the 8-inch length. It was 8 inches from here to here. You would subtract one one-inch hole, two two-inch holes, two and a half one-inch holes, because this last one only had a length of a half a hole, a radius big. That'll be multiplied times two and a half is multiplied times one to give you the length lost along that line. Eight minus the length lost gives you the net length. Multiply the length of that line times the thickness of the web. And there's two of them, so your net shear area is this number right here, whatever that calculates. Then on the tension end of things, you've also lost a half of a hole and a half of a hole on your net tension area. It used to be 5 times 0.437. Here you've lost two holes. With two holes, that's a half of a hole and a half of a hole. Each one of them was a half inch across, half inch across, half inch across. And that length times that distance gives you the cross-sectional tension area on the back side here with the holes on each side. Now all we got to do is put all those pieces together like the specs want you to do to determine how strong they are. I'll tell you this, it makes sense. If all of a sudden they go out and test it and something doesn't make sense, the first thing they do is they change the specs until it's true. Then they try like crazy to explain why it's true. And if they can never figure it out, they don't care. I mean, they care, but they don't know. If they say, look, multiply times 0 0.5, you have to do it because test is shown. That's what you need to do. Now, this is a typical failure pattern where there was a plate on the top of a wide flange and a plate on the bottom of a wide flange or possibly a S and it failed. It failed on this shear surface, two, three, failed on four shear surfaces and it failed on these relatively small tension areas. So your area net shear would be the length from here to here minus a half, one and a half, two and a half, minus two and a half holes times the thickness. The net tension area would be how far it is they drill the hole from there to the edge minus a half a hole. That'll give you this dimension times what is that thickness of? Thickness of the flange, that's correct. And there are four of those. So this right here pointed to, that's a fourth of the area net tension. That's the way these things really fail. This is not how they fail. I mean, you know, it could be. You could say, why not? You know, it's torn and loose, just like the other one had pieces torn off of it. Well, if you'll notice, you have the same shear here. 
as you have shear area here. So the shear area on both thoughts of failure are the same. The difference is the tension area is small plus small plus small plus small times. So that's small times four. That's medium. Look at the tension area here. Very large, massive, massive. Here's some discussion, and that's okay. You see something wrong in here, let me know. No, that's fine. And talking to people like that, that's fine, man. I don't ever fuss about that. The real reason I fussed is because I thought you had a complaint. No, but I'm waiting for somebody who has a complaint. Well, okay, you're not, in other words, <laughs> you're doing ugly things to my drafting skills. I was in a hurry. The shear is listed, well, it is over four. See, there's one, two. The temp tension and the shear are badly labeled. This is not a tension area. This is a shear area. That's what I thought that you were discussing over there, and I wanted to go ahead and uh, get that from you. But that's, that's not a problem. Well, I, you know, the first time I wrote it, I didn't catch it either. But last semester, you, I can assure you, a lot of people told me about it. Then I thought, well, that was pretty nifty. Let's see how many you'll catch it this time. And you did. You will. The shear area is a side that's been wiped. The tension area is the one that's been pulled straight out in tension. But the, th the reason this can't control is there's just too much extra tension area with the same shear. There's nothing wrong with checking this. It's not a good idea to check it on an exam because you're not going to get, you will get the right answer for if this failed like this, which it can't do. And then when I write down something less than 100%, I'd say, well, I would have, but I can't do because they can't do this. Same way with an angle. Every now and then I get some people who think the angle fails across here like that. The real way it fails is across the same shear area with a little bitty tension area out on the end. So the bottom line is on all of these things, the shear line, the failure line, plane never goes across the outstanding legs or elements or whatever you want to call them. You don't quite understand the words there, well then just draw the two potential failure things and take the one that has the least tension area. Shear area is usually the same. Yes, sir. Yeah, I do. Would you like to buy one? No? Well, sorry, your fees only get poorly drawn hand things. That's all you get. Now here is a beam that is being framed into a girder and they've had to cut the top out of it so that the floor will remain at the same elevation on the whole thing and they pour concrete across the top. They'll come in here and they may, like on this side, and I'll just show you one of them. Show that in 3Ds, that goes like that. Well, that goes back like that. That's why I don't do these. Goes like that, goes like that, goes like that, goes like that, goes like that. There we go. That's getting close. And then it's welded down in here like that. And it's a plate, and it's welded onto the girder, or it could just be an angle that's bolted on, and it'll have some holes in it like this. What happens is when you bolt these two together, the load on top of the beam 
has a tendency to tear this little corner out. If you still have that top flange, you won't get a failure. You'll put so much extra steel up there that it won't happen. So this is only when you cope a beam. Then you have a tendency to block shear, rupture this little piece out of the web of the beam. And the stresses they find are nicely and uniformly distributed. And you get the full strength of this little tension piece down here. If, on the other hand, you have two columns of bolts, sometimes three columns of bolts because you have a whole lot of load, it turns out the stresses are not nicely uniformly distributed. They are, they look more like this. They have found that you do not get the full strength of this little block in tension around the bottom because of their not being uniformly distributed down at the bottom. And they make you apply a factor of 0.5 to the tension term. That's the only one that they list that you have to do that to. All right, now back to the problem at hand. We'll have a nominal strength of shear of 6 tenths tension ultimate. That's shear ultimate times the net shear area. That's stress times area. Makes sense. And on the tension end of things, you'll have the full no point 0.6 here because there's no shear involved, times the steel that's really left in tension. Net means left in shear. Net means left in tension after the holes are drilled out and you have accounted for them in your calculations. So the strength, according to the specifications, you get uh, the, allowed, uh, the allowed ultimate strength of the metal in shear times how much shear area is really there, plus the ultimate intention times the area that's really still there in tension. The only thing wrong with this thing is what they find is every now and then this tension term actually doesn't have a nice uniform stress under it, and therefore you have to use a U sub BS of 0.5. Use of BS, it's on this page. I got it on page 67A. I'll show it to you. So generally speaking, your equation reads shear ultimate times how much area is in shear plus a correction under certain conditions times a tension term. Ultimate in tension times how much steel is really there. Except sometimes they find that your connections are so long that they shear and they deform a whole lot. In other words, they really do deform. And they deform so much that the little tension guy down there, he is doing this. He's coming, coming up in tension. He's yielding in tension. Everything is fine. But he's getting so much deformation, he's actually getting out in here. And they say, that's not a good idea. And so what they do is they say, if you go with the gross area up to the yield stress in shear, then we want you to stop. In other words, you can apply the ultimate stress to the steel that's really there but we found that if you exceed F sub Y in shear times the gross area, it's deformed so much we don't want you to continue. You must stop. So first thing you do is you calculate your number here. This number will be the same in both cases. But if this term right here has driven that up above F sub Y, 6 tenths F sub Y gross, you have to stop. So calculate this. Then calculate this, and I don't know, it's always interesting, you know, make sure this is less than that. Uh, that tells you what you're supposed to do. The truth is it could just as easy have said, make sure this is less than that. It works either way. You have two terms, and you want to take the lower of the two predictions. When you get through calculating the nominal resistances, because it is a breaking or a rupture situation, we want you to multiply it times 0.75. 
notes. This is part 16, chapter J, section 4.3, but the page, oh yeah. I don't remember, it looks, it seemed like the, that's, I was just trying to make sure you know these page section things again. In other words, this thing right here is in chapter J. It's in section 4.3, but they just call it section 4.3. Even though it's really chapter J, they call it just section J3. So that's a little bit different from what it's really, what it really is. It's in chapter J. Got an example. <clears throat> the terms you are going to need to work this, you're going to need the F sub U intention for your steel in use. You're going to have to know the net shear in uh, shear, the net area in shear. You're going to have to know the net area in tension. You're going to have to know the ultimate. And you're going to have to know if the stress is actually on a beam, on the end of a beam, where you have more than one column of bolts. This you'll already, this you added, you have to know this. And you'll have to, you already calculated the gross area, so you could calculate the net area from it, so hang on to that number. And then everything else here is the same. Got an example. He has seven eighths inch bolts, so he's got one inch diameter holes, A36 steel. You get these dimensions from page 1-48. That's where we put bolts in angle legs most of the time. I wouldn't guarantee you a homework problem has that, but uh, generally speaking, that's considered good practice. They're placed at three, three, and one and a half. That tells you the length of the shear block, and that tells you the width of the shear block. You'll be calculating gross shear and gross tension then you'll take out the holes, you'll take out that length times that thickness, you'll take out that length times that thickness, you'll take in this half of a hole times that thickness to turn the gross shear into the net shear. Now we'll get to that in a minute. Here are the specs. Strength of elements in shear, block shear strength, Available block shear, here's your first equation. Here is, if you get that uh, shear area so that it's so highly stressed that it actually may tend to break the thing on the end, they don't want you to go that high. They want you to limit it to 6 tenths F sub Y area gross shear. Calculate both terms, see which is the smaller. Then apply a resistance factor of 0.75. And he's got little comments. Very interesting. Well, that's where I just showed you. Typical cases where this should be taken as 0.5 are illustrated in the commentary. It'd be nice if he'd tell me where, but, you know, after a while you learn these things. It's on that page, and I got a copy of it. We already looked at it. Maybe not. 67A. Back to the problem at hand. <clears throat> shear areas are seven and a half inches long by three eighths inch thick. There are two inch, there are two and a half hole diameters, each an inch in size. So we would take the net shear area as three eighths times seven and a half. That's the total length. Subtract two whole diameters to get us the net shear. Net tension area is the area one and a half times three eighths minus a half a whole times the thickness. Three eighths, there's your one and a half minus a half of a whole. That much steel. Is the factor of 0.5 is used because there's a half a hole. I thought he was going to put a UBS on me here. I said, I don't see that. 0.5 is there's only a half a hole missing in this dimension right here. Since the block shear occurs in an angle, use of BS is equal to 1. Why? 
because of 16.1-129, equation J, uh, page 66A. Uh, here is the equation. Here's the page it's on. Here we got 87 kips, including everything in the first half of our requirements. We're supposed to make sure it does not exceed this number. Six tenths of 36. Where did the 36 come from? A36 steel. That's right. Times the area gross in uh, area gross in shear. You'll notice you have a reduced stress, but you have an increased area. Then the second term remains the same. It's 82.51. Huh? Look at that. This thing evidently would deform so much in shear that he's not going to let you let it go all the way up there. He's going to restrict you to 36 times 0.6 times the gross area, F sub Y. versus F sub U, area gross in shear versus area net in shear. So you get the lower of the two, 82.51 kips. Then to go to the design, you got to multiply times the resistance factor of 0.75. When you bring up your 1.4 dead, and you bring up your 1.2 dead plus 1.6 live plus 0.5 snow, and you put in your earthquake, and you put in your wind, and you put in all that stuff, do not come up here with a number bigger than 61.9. I won't let you through the door. If you say, I've got to have a bigger number, then you're going to have to pay for another design because that angle didn't work. Yes, sir. UBS is U for... Uh, block shear, when the block shear element is not uniformly distributed across the bottom. Here it is right here. It's on page 16.1-412. That may in our notes. Here is a little block that is pulled out only if the beam is coped. If it's not coped, you don't have to check block shear. Here it tore out a corner of an angle. As you might imagine, this is the tension side, and therefore that's where the stresses are problematic. Here's an angle that's bolted on or welded on, and the stresses are uniform, considered to be uniformly distributed. Here's a welded angle, uniform. Here's a welded angle on a, on a uh, coped beam. Here is a bolted plate or angle to the column, one row, one column of bolts. Here's an angle where the sides torn off rather than the middle out of the gusset plate. Here is a plate, a gusset plate with bolts on it, and those are considered uniform. And then all of a sudden you run across one. Here's your column, here's your beam. Here you have two columns. They have found the stresses are not nicely distributed. They do get higher than anybody thought they would because of that. And therefore, cases for which use of block shear is 0.5. So if you have three columns, use a 0.5. Yes, sir. Well, you get a lot of gain because when you put the bolts on here, the bolts on here were only half as strong as we needed. So the bolt guy did that. And she came in with uh, uh, two rows of bolts. And I said, oh, man, you're killing my beam. She says, that's not my problem. She says, if you'd like, you can get a beam where I can get eight bolts in a column there. So, man, that would be a 48 by 970 beam. She says, not my problem. She says, all I know is I need eight bolts. So I'll put them that way. Then i got to go find somebody who can do this job with the BS box shear U down to 0. 0.5. Well, with what happens is the load comes in here, and it goes through the bolts 
tending to tear this corner out. The bolts press against the angle. The angle then presses against the column, and of course we move on from there. The column load goes on down into the footing, and it goes on down into the earth, and that's the end of it. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah. The, uh, they they definitely tend to shear a block out of the out of the gusset plate, and they also tend to shear. Uh, they won't like this one right here. Won't have a block shear on the angle. No, if that's your question, there'll be no block shear on this one on the angle. There will be a block shear in the in the gusset plate. In other words, it'll pull a little chunk right out of there. All right. Another thing we worry about is a radius of gyration. Um, you can put plates all over the place. You shouldn't. You should try not to make them so thin that they have a tendency to rattle around when the wind blows. In other words, if you find that this plate works nicely, you need to really check its uh, radius of gyration about its minor axis to see what's going on. Because if it's L over R is very large, then you get these ghost noises. The wind blows and you hear clank, 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 clank. And the guy in the office says, what the devil is that? Then we drill through the hole, through the wall, and we look around and we see this thing is flopping around. Plenty strong, no problem, but then you're going to have to brace it somehow so it doesn't hit the other rod or something. It is suggested that the slenderness ratio of whatever you use, be it an angle or a plate or you name it, shouldn't be uh, over 300, but it is a suggestion. It's a notification that if you make it much over that and don't make some special provision so you don't have some of these things slapping into each other, you're going to have some noises that you don't want. Uh, now, looking at it from another point of view, if you tell me you're designing a tension member, then piece of you should be less than the nominal strength times a, an appropriate reduction factor, a resistance factor, uh, turned around the other way, uh, phi being 0.9 for yield, then P nominal would be F yield area gross. That's the number, of course, that you're trying to get larger than P sub U, your re ultimate request. You're looking for, if you know the steel you're going to make it out of, if you say it's going to be an angle, well, okay, I'm going A36, then I can tell you, you better go find me an angle that has a gross area greater than 1.2 dead plus 1.6 live or 1.4 dead or whatever, divided by 0.9, divided by F sub Y. So if I'm going to design something, that's pretty nice to know. In other words, right off the bat, I'll take your load divided by 0.9 to make the load bigger, divided by F sub Y to get P over A, uh, a P, P over sigma to get A, and then that will be, I'll have to find an area on the angle that's got that much. If you don't give me one that big to begin with, I can't even get started. To avoid fracture, you want the same idea. You want the fracture resistance factor, 0.75 times F ultimate times the effective area. You want it greater than the requested load. So the effective area ought to be greater than this number. And if you don't at least start out with that, Again, I don't have a chance. Now, you may say, well, that's not going to be as easy because the effective area depends on the length of the connection and it depends on uh, uh, all kinds of things. I say I agree, but at least it's a start. Hopefully it gives you something to start with. Centerness ratio will be satisfied if the radius of gyration is greater than L over 300. If you're talking about a wide flange, you're going to use this, about that axis for the radius of gyration. If you're talking about an angle, you'll be talking about this axis because that is the minor axis. In other words, once you put it on a plate, you can force it to bend about this axis. But once it's out between the two ends, it's going to buckle or going to bend or going to flop around about the z-axis, so you'll be looking for a radius of gyration about the 
the z-axis. So he's got an example. He's got a tension member, five foot nine long, service load, dead load eighteen, live load fifty-two. He wants a member with a rectangular cross section. Shouldn't be much to this. Don't mean to just blow through them, but day thirty-six steel. He wants the connections in a single line. He wants seven eighths inch diameter bolts, which gives you one inch diameter holes. There's your gross area. Cut across here. There's your net area. There's your load, 104.8, piece of U. Here's your required gross from our equations we just did, piece of U, 9 tenths F sub Y, piece of U, 9 tenths, right out of the tables for A36 steel. I told you to use A36. That many square inches in the plate. The effective area has to be piece of U for 0.75 F sub U. We need that much uh, effective area. Now, in this case, it's not going to be quite as hard because the effective area is the same as the net area because we don't have any unconnected outstanding elements. Now, years of experience go in that, and I know that, and I'm admitting that. He just says, try an inch. Well, what do you mean, try an inch? Why not try six inches? Well, because it's a horrible thing. I said, well, why not try half an inch? I said, well, it's not good. So you just got to start. You and me, we just got to try an inch. Therefore, the gross width would be the required gross area divided by how thick you're trying. That means it has to be 3.235 inches. Now, here's the point. If you find this is a, that a one inch thick plate requires a really wide plate, you may realize that it's going to have a very low radius of gyration, and you may say, I don't, I don't think a one inch plate is going to be a real good plate. Or if you find, after all is said and done, that thinking the plate should be one inch thick, and then it only has to be a little bitty like this. You know, you say, I don't think I've ever seen a plate where they drilled it through the edge like that. And so that's not a good choice. And all you can do is just rummage around in there until you get something that looks reasonable. That's about it. Turns out this one works out all right. One by three and a half is reasonable. If it was a one by one, that wouldn't be good. Now then we're going to check the effective area on this trial cross-section. So we go 1 by 3.5 for gross. We subtract out the area of a hole. That's the diameter of the hole. That's the thickness of the plate. And that's equal to 2.5 square inches, which turns out more than we needed. So that's a pretty good plate. And any time anything comes out that close, you can be sure somebody already tweaked the numbers before he wrote it down in the book. Here's your BH cubed over 12 for the moment of inertia of a 1 by 3.5 plate. Here's the area. I'm sure you remember that the equation for R is the square root of I over A or have access to it. Calculate the uh, minimum radius of gyration. I don't know if your book has inches squared. Anybody got a book? Well, anyway, if it does, mine does. It's not inches squared. A radius is a radius. It's a length. So that's a minor typo. Maximum L over R, 239, less than suggested, not required by the specs. Uh, but it's okay, use that plate. I was curious, anybody using the TA? Raise your hand. Anybody's using the TA we got down there for 20 hours a week? Poor guy must really be bored. Okay, read this. Uh, the example illustrates that once the required air is determined, procedures. No, no, it doesn't. It says the procedure is same, but same for LRFD and ASD. We don't do SD, so we have no idea. Uh, it's less than eight inches wide, so it's a plate instead of a bar. I don't care about that. Here he's saying for the first time, you and I have already been using it, where these gauge lengths are on angles on page 1-48 in the, in the 
specs. Here he's going to use one. He's got an angle, got 35 kips dead and live with three quarter inch diameter bolts. Means you and I are going to be using seven eighths inch holes. Factored load, 154 kips. Required gross area from our equation, same as we did last problem, 4.75 square inches. Effective area has to be this much. Don't know how I'm going to get that effective area, to tell you the truth, because I've got a lot going on here. And as best I know, no, he has. He, he told me the length of the connection. I can check that. Uh, the rates of gyration should be uh, L over 300 for the radius of gyration. So he calculates we ought to have this number on our angle when we pick it. Find the lightest shape. It says we search the dimensions and properties tables. First off, he wants an unequal leg angle. I have no idea why. Let me go ask him. He says, well, on all the equal leg angles, the angle sticks up pretty far. And I, and I lose a lot of strength because it's a five by stick in the air five angle. He says, if you get me an unequal leg angle, then you'll probably find me an eight by four angle that'll, that'll work. And invariably, you'll lay the long leg flat on the plate and you'll save me some money. So I want an unequal leg angle. Gotcha. Uh, that has the smallest acceptable gross area and check its effective net area. So about all we can do is pull one that looks like it might work on gross area and then see if we can really make this work. Uh, starting at either end of the table, here's the table, the properties table. We want something that has, what area do we need? 4.75 gross. So we go for 4.75 that one might work, six by four by half. That one might work. That's got an area of over 4.75. No, 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 no. Forget it. That's a five by five. That one might work. That's a five by three and a half by five eighths. That one might work, but it's an equal leg angle. So got a couple of choices here we can try. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah. First place, don't choose one that's lower. I mean, well, if you pick one that's lower, you're doomed already. Now then, should you pick this one or this one? You know, that's that's already chancy, but I mean, you know, we don't know. It's, it's possible that'll work. So I'm going to give it a try. You say, well, it, it's probably not going to work, so I think I'll just try this one. And then I do that one, and it works. And then you spend an extra $170,000 in steel. And I got the bid. And you're living under a bridge. <laughs> I'm going to try that one, you know. And if it won't work, then I'll suck it up and go to this one, knowing you had to do the same thing. Obviously, you know, in a class like this, you don't want to use a whole bunch of time doing things repetitively. In the real world, like I say, you get paid by the hour. And you have great you know, fun when you really find out you saved $100,000 in steel by knowing what you're doing. Uh, here are the other dimensions. Here's the radius of gyration for the angles if we decided to pick them to check if uh, L over R is okay. Here is X bar. Uh, if we're going to get ready to use a... a yeah, uh, a U, not a U, but a uh, 1 minus X bar over L term. I forget if that term had a name to it. Here's some more angles. Oh, that's bad. It sounds like this angle didn't work. Go. So we're going to try the 6 by 4 by half was the one that was pretty close. Its personal net area would be area gross minus area of the holes. There's the area gross. There's the area of the holes. We lost two uh, holes of that diameter times the thickness of a half-inch angle. Left us with 3.875. He 
He says, look, you don't even know the length of the connection, so you showing them where X bar was was no help at all. And I, un I understand that. Therefore, what I'll do is I will go to a table that gives me acceptable values whether or not I have the length or not. That is this table right here. These are our shear lag factors. Here are angles right here. Oh, oh, excuse me, forget that. We don't know the L. And therefore, we're going to go down here to single and double angles. Four or more fasteners, 0.8. That sounds good. That sounds good. Uh, where's the picture of that thing? I forget how many bolts it had. Four or more. It's got four or more bolts. If he only had three, I'd be stuck with a 0 0.6. Therefore, having four or more, I get 0 0.8 multiplied in there. Uh, here is my uh, net area is this much. Permitted to use 0 0.8 whether or not I come out with something even smaller or even worse than this later on. This is still permitted. But I will we'll check it before it's over with. No, I won't. I'm not going to bother checking anything. I'm already down to 3.07 square inches, and I'm supposed to have 3.54, 3.54 for the effective. So I'm going to have to use a different angle. You go through the same calculations again. Calculations must have been on the bottom of that page. They are. There's not any more to it than that. Here's our 5.8 for the gross. Here's the lost area, 4.9. 4.9 times 0.8. 3.94 is bigger than we need. It's okay. Then he checks the L over R. Satisfies everything. All right, now there are tables that will help you design. They are really rough. By that I mean they're just to put you in the ballpark is all they are going to do. First off, it's not a problem to go get somebody with the right gross area, but that effective area is a problem. So what they have done is they have put together some tables like so. <clears throat> the table is for the kind of steel you're going to use for that kind of a item. And here's the shape. The five, six by four by half inch angle. Tells you the gross area. And it tells you how strong the thing is in yielding. So if you need 154 kips, this, is, this guy will do it. The question is, is how about the effective area on the thing, and would, without a doubt using the .8 or something like that, he didn't tell us, and so you're just going to have to, you'll have to check this when you're through. He says, if you can live with the effective area being .75 times the gross, that includes the U, that includes the holes, that includes everything, that doesn't include block shear, you still got to check that too. I said, well, I don't, I don't accept that's anywhere near right. I have no idea. He says, well, then don't use my tables. Go away. Well, so wait, wait, wait. I guess I'm not that firm on this point. In other words, he says, that's not a bad average. It's probably half of them are too big and half of them are too small, but it'll give you 155 kips. It gives you a point to start immediately. And then, of course, you don't have to check the gross area because you know it's got the gross area capacity. All you got to do is go check all of the other little doodads in there. All right, see you next time. Go through the example he has on that if you want to use those design tables. They can be handy. Thank you. The picture you asked me about, this is the kind. 
See how the middle piece is just almost destroyed and the back part is broken? Now, had they kept on pulling it out, they'd have pulled this out across the shear as well as this. Then I could have shown you one that was fully broken. But do I have one where the channel is pulled out, or do I have one that the uh, wide flange has the flanges torn loose? I really don't. I haven't seen one of those. See, you can tell where the old plate was. Here was the old plate right here. See those lines? And obviously they marked those, you know, with the plate so they could kind of measure how far the plate was distorted or something like that. And this is, both of these are rupture on net tension area. To get rupture on the side, you'd have to use fewer bolts. Otherwise, you're just really not going to get that uh, rupture on the side. And then this thing here still be connected. Thank you. Okay. And Yeah. But now every time I, you know, look at the model and look at all the connections and think about the past <laughs> and you know going through the process. Yeah. And how they had to design that connection. Every one of them. There's a lot of work goes on in that. It really is. Yeah, you really think about that, but, yeah. Yep. Uh-huh. You too.